You know, life can be full of many challenges and difficulties, and I've experienced that personally, and I know you have experienced some really tough things in your own life. So today on the show, John F. Westfall, author of I Didn't Sign Up For This, Finding Hope When Everything Is Going Wrong, is going to help us navigate through life storms with courage, faith, and surprising joy. And so we talk a lot about how to get rid of the excess emotional baggage that weighs us down, how to invite others into our story so they can journey with us, how to have healthy expectations in our own life, and the importance of friendship to carry us through. You're not going to want to miss this show. This will encourage you to live life with hope and faith. John F. Westfall, thanks for being with me um, via Skype here in just outside of Toronto. It's good to have you on the show. Hey, it's great to be with you, Melinda. All right. Well, you've written a, a new book called I Didn't Sign Up for This, Finding Hope When Everything is Going Wrong. And I know that this has to come from personal experience. We're going to talk a little bit about the book afterwards, but I want to get into the meat of your story, get to know who you are, so our viewers and listeners know who you are as well. But why this topic and what has happened in your life that's that's brought about you writing this book? Well, that's a great question. You know, the thing is that everybody has times when uh, it just seems like everything's going wrong, one thing after another, and then it accumulates and the losses pile up, and you start to feel like, uh, uh, what, what happened to my life? Where, where did that go? Or I used to be somebody. Now I'm somebody else, and uh, uh, that and that's happened for me a, a lot along the way. And uh, but the the one that precipitated this particular uh, book was uh, I'd been going. I'd been pastoring churches, uh, large churches in uh, the United States, and um, and suddenly uh, I went for, to coffee with a couple of friends, and they go, well. Uh, you know, there's some people who don't like the direction the church is going. You're you're done. I went. What do you mean I'm done? And uh, it ended up uh, uh, affecting me in a really profound way because I, I lost my church, my friends, my community, uh, finances. My career was over. Um, wow. Uh, our credit was wrecked. Uh, we lost our home. Uh, we went through all of this stuff, and uh, and I really thought that my life was pretty much over, and uh, put a huge pressure on our marriage. And, um, and I, I, I thought, well, I'm not dead yet, but it's pretty close right now. And I was feeling like, uh, I'd, I'd basically dried up inside and stopped living. And I thought I did not sign up for this. This is not the life that I had in mind, Mm -hmm. uh, when I set out uh, years ago. And, um, and then I started talking with people and found out a whole bunch of folks who have gone through one thing after another. They lose a child or, or they lose a job or uh, marriage is struggling, relationships are hurting and uh, finances are bad. And, and they feel the same way. They feel like, what, what happened to my life? And so um, out of that uh, came a, a passion really to um, figure out how do we, how do we uh, find hope when everything's going wrong? Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's where this came from. You know, John, it's, I love hearing these kinds of stories because it's so f- it's it, it's funny in a way. I mean, sad and funny that oh, it's hysterical for everybody. Well, else. I mean, but but for many of us, for many of us, uh, somehow we've created either growing up or a culture where life should be good always, and we're oh, not prepared yeah. for hardship. And meanwhile, you know, now in my season of life, now you know, life is hard. I've had so many challenges, even as a missionary kid, a Christian girl, working in ministry, life has been hard and tough. Yeah. And, and and the the sad thing is, is a lot of times we're not prepared for it because we're, we're told and the people around us say, you know, well, if you're following Jesus, you know, life must be great and you're successful. <laughs> right. What, what do you think happened along the way, John? Why do you think many of us were are not or were not prepared for life's challenges because they're inevitable, just like we are going to die one day, inevitable, but there will always be challenges for people. But how come we don't set people up to be ready and prepared for that? That's a good question, Melinda. I I think that uh, we've done each other a disservice because we've we've, we've kind of had this underlying assumption that um, 
if we, if we have a relationship with with Christ or uh, we're, we're following Him in our life, then uh, everything's going to work out. Everything will be super. It'll be great. It'll be, people, you know, I, as a as a young person, um, I heard about. Uh, the gospel, and I and I thought, okay, I want my life good. I want the girls to like me. I, I want my room to be clean, and and so, uh, so I accepted Jesus, and and my room was still dirty, and the girls still didn't <laughs> like me. So, I go, well, either God let me down, or um, or I got this wrong, mm. <laughs> and uh, and so you know the thing is, um, uh, I think we need to take seriously, like th- one of the last things Jesus said to his followers was, in this world, you're going to have trouble. Yeah. And then why are we so shocked when, when in this world we have trouble? <laughs> it wasn't like we weren't warned. I think I think we think that, uh, well, we mean, you know, uncomfortableness. We don't mean our life's trashed. Um, yeah. But the fact is, there's trouble all around and we shouldn't be surprised. When you went through your difficulty losing your yeah. church and finances, uh, I mean, and here you're a pastor and you're feeling this. And for a lot of us, it's like a pastor of anybody should know how to deal with these things because he's equipped. He knows the scripture, the word of the Lord, you know, all that kind of thing. Emotionally, we never have stress. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so talk to me about that process, John, for you, because for a lot of people that have sort of put on high esteem pastors and they should have it all together, you know, you went through this like crash. Mm-hmm. What were the initial real raw feelings? And then how did you eventually through the process get yourself healthy and strong again to kind of continue on? Oh, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I think, um, for me, uh, I, w- I wasn't prepared for, uh, to get taken out in a power struggle, basically, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and, uh, and so, uh, I, I thought, uh, I thought my life is good. <laughs> and, uh, I did a series of churches, all with several thousand people, and uh, everything was great. And I, I kind of felt invincible, I think. And, uh, um, but when it all came down, the overriding feeling I had was shame. Actually, uh, people ask me, you know, why aren't you angry? Aren't you raging inside? Stuff? And all I could feel was shame. And I think that came from. Um, Probably a deep-seated feeling that I probably wasn't a very good person, wasn't a very good pastor, wasn't, very, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and that that eventually everybody would find out that I'm just pretending, and um, and so there was this sense of wow, I guess they must have found out that I'm a terrible person or something, mm-hmm. and uh, and so I carried that that shame that sort of uh, pushed me down, and uh, it held me down, and. It took a while to um, to discover that I was lovable um, again, uh, which which is important, I think, yeah. to actually get to that point. But that took some time. And I think that process is important. I mean, I've been through some very difficult things, and I remember, you know, at the end of my marriage when my husband mm-hmm. left, it was shame. You know, people the same thing, John. People were like, "Why are you not angry at God?" Why? I'm like, "Well, no, it's not about oh, God. Oh yeah, I got that. Question. It's about <laughs> actually." our poor relationship and bad choices we made within the relationship and then him choosing to leave. So I'm not angry at God. I'm, I'm ashamed and full of shame about my failure, <laughs> especially in ministry and being on national TV mm-hmm. and him deciding to leave. Like, was I not good enough? What was wrong with me that would cause right. me to leave? Do you know what I'm saying? And so, it, yeah, it was the process. And, and, and when that happens... Uh, Melinda, when that happens, the, it's the the person who knows you the best and should love you the most says, "Well, I don't find you that lovable," and and they leave, and and all of a sudden you go, "Wow! If anybody else knows me that well, they'll come to the same conclusion." Yeah. Huh. And so, for me, I I got to be wary, and uh, I pulled away from relationships because um, I didn't trust anyone anymore, and I didn't want to get close. I didn't want to get involved in people's lives because it might happen again. Yeah. And many people, John, do that. I've met a lot of people on my journey where they have an arm's length for people. They mm-hmm. don't trust them. And it's by it's it's because of one situation or a parent's divorce or something that's happened. And they are always living with their hand out. And yeah. yet I'm sad for them because then they never, you know, realize or get the – 
you know, get the beauty and of relationship and commitment and being known, you know, that he'll be yeah. known uh, by somebody. Risky and, and scary, and, and, but beautiful. It is risky. It is risky. And, and we feel like, well, I don't want to take that risk because I don't want to hurt. I, I don't want to feel this much pain again, so I'm not going to get out there again and take chances. Um, but I don't know, Melinda, I, I don't know any other way to be healthy than to take the risks um, and say, okay, you know, this could all blow up again. <laughs> or yeah. this, this circle of, of people around me now, they could betray me. Yeah. Um, and, and, and John, you talk but, about that risk in your book that – you know, that we are to take risks, you know, that, it, that you know, to, to continue on and live a healthy life and, and sur- mm-hmm. not just survive, but thrive after challenges and, and heartache, um, that there is that part of taking risks in life. And there's a lot of people that don't want to. They want to play it safe. Um, oh, yeah. Talk to me more about that, because I think that's an important thing for even myself and viewers to hear about this whole idea of taking risks and, and what's the benefit of doing that. Well, uh, there, some people are prone to risk. You know, they like to they like to dance around on the edge of the abyss, and some people like to hunker down far, mm-hmm. you know, uh, where they never step out at all, and uh, which I think leads to a really dull life. Um, yeah. It's not a great adventure at that point, but um, but I understand that that when we're hurting and when life is falling apart, there's a sense of I, I can't risk anymore. I can't. Mm. Um, I can't get involved with people anymore because they're they're going to reject me or something like that. Um, we ended up moving across country and uh, planting a new church uh, in in the city of Seattle. Uh, it, was, it felt like doing the drive of shame across North Dakota, <laughs> and Montana, you know, all this stuff, and and plopped into Seattle where. Uh, we didn't have much going on and, uh, and start, start over again. Wow. And, uh, and, and I felt at the time, this is a big risk, but then there was also that little bit inside me that went, you've got nothing to lose. Mm-hmm. You've lost everything. Uh, so why not? Uh, how bad can that be after, after you get run over by a truck yeah. emotionally? And so, but, but we did that. And I look back on it now, Melinda, and, and think, uh, wow, that actually became very healing. Hmm. Um, uh, the church never became a big monster, you know, a couple thousand people or anything like that, but it was, uh, <laughs> basically turned into a church for people who didn't want to go to church anymore. Yeah, and, uh, that. because that's yep. kind of where I was. <laughs> and so one by one folks were brought in who, uh, hadn't been to church in 20 years and, thought, I don't know if I can handle this. <laughs> and then we just became sort of a uh, uh, a community together. You know, John, I think that's that's a really good life lesson for us because I think a lot of times us people, Christians, we sort of have this one track of how life should be, you know, whether mm-hmm. you graduate and you get married and you have kids and then you get your job and you go on vacation and blah, 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 blah. And then it doesn't work out. And over and over, people have like tapped out because of how because it didn't go the way they wanted to. And oh, yeah. I've seen people where I'm sad for them in a way because they're missing out on the fullness of life that you know God has. There's so many different opportunities and ways that God will work with people if they're willing. And yet we have shut him down to say, nope, you know, um, I'm hurt, I'm angry. And I'm just going to hunker down and be safe and not do it. And mm-hmm. I think that's important for us to know that, you know, if we're not going to risk or trust God that he's got a better plan, then what are we doing in a sense, right? What are how, are we really well, living? You know, um, for me, I I was struck with the um, with the understanding that when everything goes wrong, that's when the adventure begins. Hmm. If, if we're going along and life's okay and we're in control and everything's predictable, it's not going to be an adventure. Yeah. It'd be like kind of like a, going on a Disneyland ride where you, there's a track underneath, but you know, mm-hmm. we think we're really wild and, uh, <laughs> but it's just going along on the track. And that's what our lives are like a lot of times, especially for us as Christians. Um, but it's when everything goes wrong that we go, okay, now I'm going to have to trust God. I'm going to have to get out of my comfort zone. I'm going to have to live differently. Um, 
And then it becomes quite an adventure at that point. Yeah. I should have called the book that, but then nobody would have bought it. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is, a, this is a good title for the book. Uh, one of the things, too, that you talk about that I find interesting, and I've used this language, is that one of the issues that kind of keeps us back from really living this adventure is the baggage that we carry with us. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a really interesting thing because, you know, baggage clearly, visually, you can see it's it's heavy and it, and it weighs us down. But a lot of us choose not to let go of the baggage and set it down. We carry it our whole lives. Oh, um, yes. Yeah, talk to me about that because all of us have baggage, but why is it that we feel we need to hold on to it so tightly and not let it go. You know, and these are bad things. You know, we're talking <clears throat> emotional baggage and all and kinds of baggage. Things. We, we, we carry stuff with us. Um, down, down here in the States, we, we have a, uh, a cable show called The Hoarders. And, it, and it's scary yes, because it's people it. who just can't let go of anything. Yeah. And, uh, and you go, that's creepy. And then I go, wait a minute. That's what my life is like most of the time. I'm hanging on to stuff and carrying it around with me and I can't let it go. And, uh, and I'm, bogged down because of uh, all this baggage that I'm carrying, but I still have trouble releasing it. And uh, um, I'm the kind of guy who overpacks for a trip, you know? Yeah, me too. And, uh, oh, and I'm terrible. always overweight, and then I always have to go to the oh, go yeah. and buy an extra bag for like 50 bucks, which I know it's only worth like 20, and put my excess stuff in. <laughs> oh, I still have a I still have a mental image of the Montreal train station where they're giving me plastic bags to sit there in the in the place and unpack a bag and put it in these little plastic bags while the people walking by are hoping I'm not sitting in their area. And it's so embarrassing. It's so humiliating. It <laughs> but I sat there going, "Well, this is me. You know, this is what I got. I carry my stuff with me." <laughs> So, but but it's so funny and silly, but yet we still hold on to these oh, I know. things. And 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 why is that? And and what's your encouragement to say? How do you go? Okay, I'm dropping it. Like what? What's your advice on that? Well, I think it needs to be really intentional. Yeah. I don't think that that we're just going to uh, accidentally change our life for the better. Yeah. Um, or wake up and not be emotional hoarders, or something like that. Right. Um, I think we need to actually sit down and go. Wow, I've carried that bitterness a long time. <laughs> you know, maybe it's time to set that down. Or, mm-hmm. or I've been carrying this resentment with me, or this fear. I can't get over this fear. It just comes up and chokes me every time I start to do something, or, or get close to someone. Um, and and so, I I would encourage people to actually sit down and make a list of some things that you want to let go of. Um, like for me, I I uh, realized at one point. If I don't change, I'm going to be such a bitter old man. Now, I'm only 30 years old, but I've had a tough life, you know, and that's why I look so old. But, you know, <laughs> the thing is that um, uh, I, I thought if I'm going to, I'm just going to be bitter because I can't even bring myself to feel thankful about anything. I, I always think of the reason why it's not working out or things could have been different or what happened to my mm-hmm. other life or, the, you know, that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. And so I made myself a uh, experiment where I had to be like willfully, almost violently thankful and, uh, and just force myself. And so I'm driving along in the car. OK, think of something to be thankful for. Think of something. Hey, I, uh, I can't think of anything. And then, OK, well, all right. then. That, Lord, thanks for that tree over there. Yeah, that's a nice tree, which is stupid. You know, I mean, the whole thing is just stupid and, and tiny and meaningless. And But I, I found something, you know. And then pretty soon, though, I started uh, feeling thankful. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> and people would ask me, hey, how are you doing? And instead of saying, oh, I'm doing really terrible, blah, 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 instead I would go, wow, I'm grateful. Yeah. You know, my, I'm blessed. And and I actually felt that. I mean, it, it wasn't faking it anymore. Um, I even did a thing where, uh, for a period of time, every day I had to write a thank you note to someone. Wow. <laughs> and I thought, at first, I'm sitting there at my desk going, I don't know, a single person I'd write a thank you note to. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then you kind of do one, and then, and then the next day, well, I, I've just written to the only person I could thank. What am I going to do now? Mm-hmm. And then you have to write another one. And so I started doing that. And then That's pretty good. soon I realized I've got a lot of people in my life that I am uh, grateful for. No, I like that one. That's actually a really good tip. I think that's something that a lot of us could do. And then it puts the perspective and focus off you and oh, onto yeah. other people, that whole selfish to, you know, 
you know, being selfless and other centered, which is something I think more of us could be like, you know, John, the finding hope and everything is going wrong. So we've talked about, you know, getting rid of the baggage, taking mm-hmm. risks. Um, you know, this other idea you have is, uh, this is one that, you know, we, we don't talk a lot about, but healthy expectations for yourself and others. I think that's a big one. It's like we know it's there where we have unhealthy expectations for myself and others, but we don't really talk about it honestly. Um, talk a little bit about that because you, you say that, you know, we need to have healthy expectations in our life about our relationships and with ourselves. And that's, that's something that can help us too um, as we go through challenges in our own life as well. Sure. You, you know, <clears throat> sorry. The thing is that um, uh, I, it's it's hard to be realistic sometimes and, and not feel like uh, you've given up on dreams and things. Mm-hmm. But um, for example, I, I've done, I don't know, a thousand weddings or something over the years. And premarital counseling, which I always did, is such a waste of time. Because you sit down with people and you try and tell them, okay, this is going to get yeah. rugged. This is going to get tough. <laughs> You're going to have to work at it. And they're going, well, you need to read a book on uh, self-talk, you know, <laughs> and uh, be more positive because mm-hmm. we're in love and everything's going to be great. And we don't have those kind of issues. So I, I always feel like, oh, what a waste. I wish I could talk to these people about a year into their marriage when they're ready to kill each other. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and, their, and their dreams are shattered. And mm-hmm. uh, now they're trying to figure out what do we do? You know, that's the great time to sit down and talk. But um, but their expectations are, we're going to be different than everybody else, and our life's going to be different, and we're not going to have to work at it. Mm-hmm. Um, which you know, more power to them. But uh, the f- fact is that life has a way of catching up with us, and it, life has a way of uh, sometimes beating us up a little. And uh, and and we we need to be uh, not in dread, but we need to be uh, open enough that we can handle. Uh, realistic life yeah that's what i'd like i'd like to have a life that's honest and realistic and authentic and uh not based on some fantasy of what i wish it was or what it i hoped it might have been you know that sort of thing yeah um no, because then we can start feeling uh grateful again yeah. and we can start feeling blessed you know i love that and i and i think sort of the final thought john is in your book you you, you talk about another part of finding hope in life is let people into your story. And I'm Mm -hmm. big on story, that's what my show is called. And I would say, you know, I'm a storyteller. Um, But that's an important one, that we let people into our story, even as fragmented and broken as it is, or shame-filled, there still is, that I believe, part of sort of God's community and the call of Jesus in our lives to be in relationship. So mm-hmm. tell me your thoughts as we finish up this show about this okay. important part well, of bringing I, people I into the story. It, it is really important because um, uh, the alternative is in, incredible loneliness and mm-hmm. being cut off and self-protection, yeah. you know. Uh, but it's hard to do because vulnerability means that we give uh, other people the weapons that can hurt us. We share the things about mm-hmm. ourselves that they could use against us. You know, we hope they won't. But they might, mm-hmm. and uh, and that's a very frightening thing to do. But I don't know any other way to be healthy, uh, uh, except being vulnerable and and sharing. And uh, uh, you know, in our life, we I've had a lot of things go on. And this is not just this one story. I mean, um, uh, we uh, my wife had a home invasion uh, where she was almost murdered uh, years ago, and wow. and uh, that's affected us in terms of fear and trust and where we live and all those kind of things. Uh, my son has had a history of mental illness and been one mental hospital after another and struggling to live. And uh, and I'll tell you what, as a pastor of large churches, um, to have mental illness in your family is not always a popular item mm-hmm. uh, among the congregation. And, uh, uh, but like, for example, when that, when that first came out about our son's mental illness and, uh, suicide attempts and things like that. Um, my wife thought, I can't stand this alone. So she put a little blurb in the uh, church bulletin, uh, support group for moms whose kids are in mental hospitals or jails. <laughs> and uh, wow. and she said, uh, you know, come on Tuesday night. And she thought maybe there'd be one or two people that they might be able to talk. She walked into the room and the room was full. And all these, wow. all these moms were there saying, well, I thought 
the church was a place where we'd never be able to talk about what's happening in our family. And, uh, and that gave me shivers. I, th I thought that everybody's got their secrets because they're just afraid they won't be included if the truth comes out, what they're dealing with. And that's when we need to be included. Uh, there's part of the healing, I think, is that if we let people into our life, we're, we're honoring them by, uh, letting, by inviting them in. And um, when we tell our story, it's a great gift uh, to give to someone to say, this, this is my life. Yeah. Good, bad, hard, difficult, exciting. Uh, and, I, and I don't want to keep it from you. That's so powerful. John, you know, I think that's so important because I think, first of all, thank you for your honesty and authenticity. And I love these stories because there's so much of God in the mess of the story. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how I could live my life without a relationship with him. But mm -hmm. I also, you know, agree so much about allowing people in even when you don't want them to come in, but that you need a community to be there to help you in this journey. Because it's, you know, life is hard and it's, you know, I love it. The title of your book, um, you know, I didn't sign up for this. And there are days, John, I'm like, I didn't sign up for this at all. I know. <laughs> I'm out. I know. <laughs> um, but I, I really love, you know, your points about finding hope means, you know, the importance of friendship and and getting rid of the baggage and letting people into your story and healthy expectations and, you know, hope. And I love that it comes from like a, a real place of honesty for you and your family. So thank you so much for sharing that. It really was encouraging to me. Well, it's great to be able to visit with you and uh, have mm. this conversation. It's yeah. been great. You're, you're a fabulous interviewer, by oh. the way. You're the best, the very best. John, you know, me being like 20, just beginning my career. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm somewhere in that age. But anyway. Somewhere. And, yeah. and I'm only 30. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm life, saying. We're so know. young. We have our whole lives ahead of us. <laughs> our story's going to continue for a long time. Um, where can we pick up your book, John? Because I know that Anywhere. my viewers and listeners want to pick it up. Yeah, any of your local bookstores okay. or uh, uh, Amazon or yeah. anything like that. Um, they can force pick them it up. to get it. Force them to get okay, it. Okay, I will force them to get it. Go get it. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that right to the viewers. Well, it was a pleasure, John. All the best to you, and thanks for joining me here just outside of Toronto. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Hey, wait. I know the show has ended and all, but could you introduce me to some of your really good friends? Sharing this episode on social media really helps us reach more people, and this story can inspire others to get stronger in their faith. You can also find all our past episodes online at faithstrongtoday.com slash your story.